thank you. Okay, uh, first to decipher this long, long title. I'm going to be talking about medical phenomenology, a, a, a conceptual uh, approach to uh, rethinking uh, medicine. So um, why I'm doing this is because with person-centered healthcare um, still in its early development, its founders, us, uh, have been tasked, uh, its founders have tasked contributors with building both its empirical and its conceptual basis. And uh, I'm a philosopher of medicine, so my contribution is going to focus on the latter, on constructing an adequate and instructive theoretical framework to guide the movement's development as a robust philosophy of medicine that motivates high quality research and practice that meets uh, what we're now formulating as person-centered goals. So to this end, um, person-centered healthcare has a, a strong history of medical reform movements to draw from in order to define its own conceptual framework. Uh, Person-centered health, uh, person healthcare uh, joins a growing field of academic literatures that have been attempting to solve what is commonly referred to as the crisis of modern medicine. So over the past uh, 70 years or more, there's been a variety of critics subscribing to different theoretical orientations that have described modern medicine quite similarly as, as technologically inspiring but lacking in humanity. And you've already heard that characterization in, in, in the morning talks. So frameworks have been developed to try to bring this much needed human touch back to our scientifically advanced curative abilities. Some of them you will know already, the bi biopsychosocial model in the 1970s, humanistic medicine in the 70s and 80s, medical phenomenology, which is my focus today, in the 1990s, and patient-centered care and uh, um, and narrative medicine in the early 2000s. And all of these models were similar in that they challenged biomedicine and later evidence-based medicine to bring back medicine's compassionate or its, its caring core, something that the critics suggested had once been central to medical practice, but had been lost in the rapid advances in medical technological capabilities that sort of went upwards po post-World War II. So, um, as, I as I said, my focus is going to be on medical phenomenology. Um, I think at this early point in person-centered healthcare's conceptual development, it's worth considering how this area can enrich person-centered healthcare's theoretical basis. I think it's worthwhile doing, looking at all of these movements and thinking what it can offer and what, what we should learn to stay away from in uh, person-centered healthcare. Uh, but I'm, I'm focusing on medical phenomenology because I noticed right away in the reading that I've done on person-centered health care that there are some conceptual linkages between medical phenomenology and person-centered um, uh, care that, that immediately uh, stands out. Uh, for starters, um, in a 2011 editorial on person-centered health care authored by Miles and Mezek, um, the authors adopted this language of crisis and subscribed to this characterization of the problem of medicine as being this, this deficit of humanity. The new person-centered framework is of course supposed to correct that problem. And uh, I'd like to show today that the pheno phenomenological approach to medicine offers some very helpful guidance for the person-centered corrective, but I think it actually fails to be sufficiently corrective. And I'd like to say a little more about, about why that is and, and how we can work around that. So uh, as I mentioned, medical pheno phenomenology arose as, as a response to biomedicine, a criticism of biomedicine, and as an alternative to um, an alternative philosophy of medical practice to, to, the, to the prevailing biomedical model. And this is uh, something I came up with, uh, which I'll try to substantiate, the, what I see as the basic structure of a, of a philosophy of medical practice. Uh, you start with a theory of the body or a conception of the body which informs some kind of theory of illness, which in turn is going to inform some theory of what good medical practice it actually is, how medical practice actually responds to the problem of illness. So uh, with that in mind, here is a brief primer on medical phenomenology. So um, phenomenology, it's the study of phenomena as they present themselves to consciousness or as they appear. Uh, in other words, medical phenomenology tries to extract phenomena from our conceptual frameworks in order to investigate how objects and events appear to us without preconceived notions 
from a first person perspective. It's supposed to be looking at events and objects in some sort of raw state without all that baggage that we have like science and other frameworks out there. Uh, this uh, comes from the great German philosopher Edmund Husserl who founded the phenomenological school and championed the adoption of what he called the phenomenological attitude, which means suspending what one assumes or has been taught about the nature of reality in order to gain insight and understanding of the world. And Husserl thought this was particularly important to suspend the beliefs in the truth of object and in the truth and objectivity of science. So it was particularly important to suspend our beliefs about science in order to see the world in, in, in a clearer way. And this is the book in which uh, he wrote it, in the crisis of European sciences and transcendent, transcendental phenomenology. This is, this is the first uh, English translation uh, of the book. Okay, so when medical phenomenologists reflect on scientific matters, They'll set aside any of empirical science's assumptions about the world we live in. Assumptions like the world is independently real, it exists independently of us, uh, it's observable, and therefore it's amenable to empirical methods and manipulations. We set those assumptions aside. The sciences presuppose the kind of thing that, that uh, phenomenology is trying to elucidate, namely the meaning structures through which our comprehension and ascription of meaning to objects in the world are first of all made possible. So there's this mismatch between the lived experience of the world and a scientific explanation of the world. And this is supposed to be revealed through phenomenological analysis. Husserl saw this gap to be so significant that he attributed it to uh, what he called a crisis of meaning in the sciences. So this crisis of modern medicine, that's the language comes from Husserl, just, just so you know. Um, specifically, despite the impressive techniques of controlling nature, science cannot address questions of human understanding. Um, that was human self-understanding. That was Husserl's position. So that, he, he wrote this, this uh, decades earlier, but in the 1990s, his ideas got picked up um, by philosophers of medicine. They created this field called medical phenomenology, and they charged biomedicine was suffering from a similar crisis of meaning, as that described by Husserl regarding science in general. Now the philosopher Drew Leder captured this crisis situation in these words. I'm going to read a, a quote from, from Drew Leder. Um, a critique has been leveled at modern medicine which goes something like this. Medical practice, though it has gained much over the last century in clinical efficacy, has lost something as well. Most importantly, it has progressively lost the human touch. Patients are often treated as depersonalized, even dehumanized fashion with modern medical healthcare systems. Their suffering is not heard and responded to. Their wishes are not fully incorporated into treatment decisions. Their resources for self-healing are not called into play. Uh, that's the end of the quote. Medical phenomenologists reasoned that this complaint of depersonalized treatment of patients could be remedied by attention to the patient's lived experience of illness. That first person perspective was what was missing. Um, uh, missing from biomedical thought and practice. So medical phenomenologists often directed their philosophical writing towards medical practitioners, sometimes even writing in medical journals in order to get their um, point across, in order to, to really get, get the word to, to uh, physicians that they really had to listen to their patients. And um, for an as an example, uh, the philosopher Richard Barron wrote this, Introduction to Medical Phenomenology in the Annals of Internal Medicine, which is an unlikely place to be doing phenomenological research. And uh, this is what he wrote to his, uh, his audience who are physicians. He wrote, a great gulf exists between the way we think about disease as physicians and the way we experience it as people. Much of this separation derives directly from our basic assumptions about what illness is. Our medical worldview is rooted in an anatomical pathological view of disease that precludes a rigorous understanding of the experience of illness. What we need to remedy this problem is not just the admonition to remember that our patients are people, but a radical restructuring of what we take disease to be. The philosophic discipline of phenomenology is used to present a vision of disease that begins with the understanding of illness as it is lived. Non-medical descriptions of illness show how physicians can reorient our thinking to encompass both our traditional paradigm to one that takes human experience seriously as it takes human experience as seriously as it takes anatomy. Okay, that's the end of the quote. 
So we, I think we see that in this passage, uh, the patient narrative is revalued. It's not merely a superficial cover or an entry point for true pathophysiological causes of illness and diseases, but rather a legitimate and relevant source of medical knowledge. So with that in mind, um, I'll turn to um, conceptions of the body in medical epistemology. So what I'd like to do is introduce two competing visions of the body. On the, here we have biomedicine's mechanistic view of the body, and on this side we have the phenomenological lived body. Now, medical phenomenologists attribute this dehumanized style of modern medicine that we're so worried about to how biomedicine regards the body. They say biomedicine is, are, uh, relies on a vision of a body that's something like a machine a view that undercuts the subjectivity of patients. Um, and a little history on that, the mechanical body was a feature of the mechanistic philosophy that marked the scientific re revolution, um, where at that time um, materialism or Cartesian materialism replaced the scholastic teleological view of nature, this idea that natural phenomena had a purpose, um, and got some sort of God-given purpose. So modern thought rid the body as previously conceived by the scholastics of the soul or any function or purpose. Instead, the body was now understood to be driven by mechanical forces. And this allowed, this, this rethinking of the body allowed for the study of anatomy and pathology to flourish in late Renaissance European human medicine because social and religious taboos regarding autopsy could be relaxed. So suddenly we saw a great increase in, in, our, in our understanding of, of, the, of the body. Um, modern diagnostic technologies like the stethoscope and the x-rays have been argued to, to add to this regard of the body as a machine because these, these technologies allow a kind of opening up and dissection of the living body. And while other technologies allow us to quantify body functions, test fluids, um, with that progression of technological advance, it soon became quite possible for physicians to diagnose and chart the course of illness almost without talking to their patients. So given this reductive vision of embodiment underlying our disease categories, it's not that surprising that the process often culminates in mechanistic forms of treatment. Now, we must acknowledge that there's been a lot of success in treating the body in this mechanistic kind of way. For example, treating the heart as um, a muscle pump or an electrical system allows us to draw from a therapeutic arsenal of pharmaceuticals, exercise regimes, dietary changes, or surgery, where you can alter the body the way you would fix a mechanical thing, substituting parts, alternating inputs and outputs, regulating processes, and so forth. So, so there's a lot of people that would defend this view. It's a, it's a good way to treat the body. Um, now, although any good clinician also engages the patient as person too, the predominant thrust of modern medicine has been upon this mechanistic style of intervention. And, and as I said, it does work well, but despite all these amazing achievements, the overlooked humanistic variables are argued to continually peek through the cracks of mechanistic medicine. It's because a machine is not an existential being that its misperformance or its breakdown can be properly explained solely in terms of mechanical forces. That really isn't quite the case with human disease where experiential factors like desires, perceptions, and expectations figure in uh, significantly. So um, now to contrast these two competing medical models, the biomedical model and the phenomenological model. Um, because phenomenology is grounded in lived experience, the body is re reconceived from an, an experiential perspective. The mechanistic model of the body is substituted with the lived body, the body as it is experienced by the individual. And the theory of illness follows from that. Um, this fo follows from this first person account of the body. Rather than illness being defined by the diagno diagnosis of body dysfunction or a machine's breakdown, as, a, as is, a, is the case with biomedical model, the phenomenological theory of illness is embodied insofar as it captures the experience of a sense of disorder that illness brings about and the way that illness changes one's way of being in the world, one's way of interacting with the world. So while the experience of the healthy body, 
So this is the experiential phenomenological account of the body. The healthy body often recedes from our attention and can be taken for granted um, you know, when we do our daily tasks. The ill body is stubborn in that it demands our attention in the experience of pain, fatigue, or maybe new limits on mobility. So it's, it's, it's a demanding new experience of, of, of the world through our bodies. So this embodied theory of illness, which is predicated on the lived body rather than the body scientifically described, invites a more humane and patient-centered medical practitioner. The philosopher K. Toombs argues that medical training encourages physicians to slip into a third-person analysis or a scientific understanding of illness. And by doing that, they may fail to meet the emotional and informational needs of their patients who understand and interpret their illness largely from a first-person perspective. So physicians were argued uh, by tombs and others that they need to work to understand what illness means to the patient. Um, in the therapeutic context, physicians must not dialogue with the patient while harboring some preconceived notion of disease as a breakdown of the body. Instead, they need to know what it actually means to the patient in the context of his or her life and, and goals. So what, what medical phenomena, phenomenologists um, prescribe in the end is what they call intertwined medicine. That's the theory of medical practice, an intertwining of scientific evidence and patient's experience, uh, a mixing of values and concerns, physiology and, and intentionality, empiricism and phenomenology. It's, it's, it's a mixing of the two. So here, the scientific perspective is not the singularly correct interpretation of the nature of things, nor is it completely denied. Instead, it's, um, it's um, part of a broader phenomenological framework. It provides much meaning and understanding of things, but it's only part of the, of the picture. So how is this helpful for um, person-centered healthcare? Now I'll turn to person-centered healthcare. So here's the good. I think the intertwined medicine uh, model of medicine captures a highly desirable goal of medicine, which is to meet both scientific and humanistic aspirations. Medicine was famously characterized by bioethicist Edmund Pellegrino as the most humane of the sciences and the most scientific of the humanities. I don't know if he was describing medicine or, or prescribing medicine when he, when he um, said that, but um, I think it's correct to hold on to that difficult goal, one that we still haven't achieved today. Uh, I know you've already seen one news clipping today, but here's another one. That same criticism of inhumane medicine that we've been hearing for decades is still seen today. This is from last week at National Public Radio heart of the matter, treating the disease instead of the person. So that same criticism is still there. The phenomenological account of illness is powerful in offering an experientially intuitive illness narrative um, as a totalizing experience of things just not being right in the world. And um, the, pers the patient perspective, this prominence of the first person perspective is also particularly helpful for uh, those of us thinking about chronic disease, which is a major focus of person-centered healthcare because it's, uh, um, it, it's, it gives us a way of thinking about the, the unique expertise that comes with the experience of long-term chronic illness. Now, um, these useful additions, I think, only enrich some of person healthcare's goals. I'm returning to that 2011 editorial by Miles and Mezik. Um, where they drafted sort of a preliminary conceptual framework for person-centered healthcare. And they define person-centered healthcare as this, a medicine of the person, by the person, and with the person. The first part is medicine of the person captures the patient-centeredness of past movements, including medical phenomenology and their call for a holistic view of the patient um, and, and uh, an experiential framework of, of illness. Now, the call for medicine by the person is actually novel in its attention to the humanity of the physician being called, uh, called to attention as well. It promotes clinicians extending themselves as full human beings. I'm, I'm quoting Miles and Mezek here, well grounded in science and with high ethical aspirations. Medicine with the person calls for collaborative and empowering decision making partnerships involving families, patients and clinicians. And uh, while other movements have called for this participatory decision-making framework, 
none except for person-centered healthcare have recognized the precondition of a humane physician in order to do that. So for example, evidence-based medicine also calls for some sort of integrated decision-making framework, for example, uh, incorporating patient values and preferences into a decision-making model. But at the same time, they limit the humanity of physicians, taking away uh, tacit model, uh, sorry, tacit knowledge, clinical judgment, uh, any relational understanding of the patient that a physician must have. So there's really no direction on how that relationship arises when the physician is so constrained in the kind of inputs that they can put into the decision-making uh, model. So here is part of a solution that I'd like to offer, and I'll say it quickly. So to do this, I actually introduce, need to introduce another medical reform movement. This one is called uh, interpretive medicine, which I think can help to address that missing dimension of person-centered healthcare, that, that this physician as a meaningful participant in a communicative and relation, relational patient-centered exchange. Um, this um, model, interpretive medicine, has been slowly developing over the past decade as a response to the evidence-based account of clinical reasoning, that the, the decision-making process undertaken by medical personnel involved in patient care. So this reform movement, I didn't mention it at first because it's not concerned with bringing the patient back into the picture of medicine. That's, that's, that's just not its focus, not that it's against it. Um, instead, this movement is interested in challenging evidence-based medicine's exclusion of clinical judgment from good clinical decision-making. Uh, it's a move that critics say is impossible and when attempted, um, probably irresponsible to patient care. So instead, they want to champion the reasonable exercise of clinical judgment by physicians, not explicit bias, of course, but reasonable clinical judgment, and, and to acknowledge that the physician in her therapeutic role does a lot more than enter inputs into a decision-making algorithm or evaluate clinical evidence or, or follow clinical guidelines um, uncritically. So, most of the criticisms we've seen of evidence-based medicine, like the ones that appear in the um, many thematics of the, of the Journal of Evaluation and Clinical Practice, has focused on, on uh, what counts as evidence. We know that evidence is configured differently around evidence-based medicine. Um, more focus on experimental controls, quantified measures, um, and suddenly clinical experience and observational data become suspect because of the worry about uh, bias. And although those discussions have been um, about the best evidence, couched within that vision of, new, of best evidence is also um, a model of clinical reasoning. And you actually can find an explicit reference to this in, uh, this is a founding document of evidence-based medicine. I'm sure you all know this, this piece um, that came out uh, in uh, JAMA in 1992. And this was their new approach to clinical reasoning that kind of just got slipped in there, didn't get a lot of, uh, discussion. They wrote, a new paradigm for medical practice is emerging. Evidence-based medicine de-emphasizes intuition, unsystematic clinical experience, pathophysiology, uh, pathophysiologic rationale as sufficient grounds for clinical decision-making, and stresses the examination of evidence from clinical research. Now here's the new, the new approach. EBM requires new skills of the physician, including efficient literature searching and the application of formal rules to the evidence. So the position of interpretive medicine advocates is against this. They say that um, the application of clinical evidence to clinical patient care is not properly characterized as procedural or, or a systematic inference from trial to particular patient. Instead, what you get is a much more interpretive practice. When we, when we take a naturalized approach of how physicians actually make clinical decisions, it looks a lot more like an interpretive exercise, which requires a more complex skill set. Um, the kind of skills that you need are introspection, compassion, understanding um, interpersonal skills, sound clinical judgment, and that's in addition to having a good grasp of the scientific evidence. And I think it's here that a, that a medicine by the person starts to emerge. Prefer preferably this person is a good critical thinker and a conscientious person too, not just any old person will do. So for example, if you're doing, uh, uh, under the rubric of interpretive medicine, if you're looking at how medical diagnosis is done, 
Um, a physician needs to deliberate over and amalgamate many sources of information. Some of them are, or sorry, I call them evidentiary warrants here. The patient's reports of symptoms, physician's observation of the patient, knowledge of the history, background medical knowledge, even test results. And, and I'm sure you can appreciate that these are qualitatively and quantitatively very different informational inputs. So there really is no formula for how these warrants weigh against each other. Instead, the physician must fit the pieces together in order to make some kind of coherent interpretive story, one that's, of course, concurs with the evidence, but we recognize that the evidence needs to be, there's, there's gaps in the, in the logic there that need to be filled up in with you know, good old-fashioned clinical judgment. There's really no, no way to get around that. Treatment recommendations are, are similarly, similar in that they require interpretation. How do we decipher clinical trial evidence? How do we weigh evidentiary warrants and how applicable are specific findings to individual patients? Um, how, do we, how do we bring in patients' preferences to, into that consideration? Um, how do, uh, we need to consider the clinical setting, whether we can support those kind of treatment recommendations. It, 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 goes on, it, it continues and gets more and more complex, and that's the interpretive story that interpretive medicine is, is speaking about. And um, uh, I, I guess the bottom line of interpretive medicine is we can't get away from that contribution of clinical judgment. As subjective and partial and bias prone as it can be, there's no other way to do this kind of work. So this naturalized look at the cognitive processes actually involved in clinical reasoning leads interpretive medicine away from fantastical calls to rid medicine of clinical judgment. Furthermore, clinical judgment provides the interpretive tools required by physicians to navigate the limited evidence and even rigorous clinical trials offered by patients. So now I'll, I'll, uh, I'll sum up here. Um, yes, um, okay, so uh, I've just introduced medical phenomenology as a helpful, helpful framework for exploring person-centered healthcare's commitment to medicine by the person the medicine that takes the patient seriously. But I suggested that it offered no insight into medicine by the person, that is medicine by a humane cl clinician, which I suggested is a precondition for relational medicine with the person. So I offered some insights from interpretive medicine as a reaction against this evidence-based formulaic account of clinical reasoning to ground the medicine by the person alongside medical phenomenologies assistance in, in, in highlighting the humanity of the patient. And uh, in the end, the full humanity of both parties, the patient and the physician, is required for achieving the goals of person-centered healthcare, and that's what we should be striving for. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's so nice to be here. Not many people, but some of the most influential writers I have encountered, encountered during these last 10 to 15 years are actually here, looking at one of them, if you <laughs> complexity. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I feel really honored to, to be here. And uh, I took on a terrible title. It was suggested, and I was given, I think, two opportunities to change it. Because I think perhaps the organizers thought I should not speak under this title, but I accepted it. I'm a medical doctor. We are used to being thrown into things, and we'll have to make the best out of it. And I decided for myself that if medical doctors are not at the heart of change, I think we can struggle a long time. So I took on epistemology and ontology. Uh, I'm not a philosopher, and I hope we can have a good dialogue. And I would like really to add that I think your presentation was wonderful, Maya. It didn't surprise me because I have read some of your papers. So uh, to start with how it works, there is no contradiction between thinking medicine in terms of biology, that is molecules and physiologies, and thinking in terms of stories, biography, narrative, personhood, all these uh, movements that we have been hearing about. Uh, I think the best way of expressing this, expressing this has been uh, formulated by Gregory Bateson. I don't know if he's a name. Do you recognize that name? Anthropologist and so on? Yes. Um, mind and nature, a necessary unity. He says this. But I come with stories, not just a supply of stories to deliver to the analyst, but stories built into my very being. And by uh, this, I think he means even in my biology, my anatomy. 
I'll say a little bit about myself since we are personalized here or person-centered. I come from Trondheim uh, in the middle of Norway, or should I say the middle of nowhere? I don't know. One of those 2,000-something medical schools, uh, and I will come back to that, what we do in medicine. Trondheim is mainly famous for the Nidaros Cathedral. It used to be a site of pilgrimage and worship. People really traveled through Europe to get to this place in the medieval times. And here is the modern site of uh, natural science worship. It's the hospital campus. <laughs> and this is the house where I work, the colorful one, and we have a general practice research unit. And we are quite radical, a few of us, we think, but in quite a conservative medical school, as you will now see. Here are our students. They are mostly white, and many of them are female, and they're very nice people, and they want to do a good job. If you wonder in Norway whether to study medicine, the first thing you have to accept is that it's very, very hard to get into medicine. We get the brightest students of all looking at the grades from, from uh, secondary school. If you are contemplated whether to use your good grades to become a lawyer or medical doctor or something, you can read about medicine. And the first sentence on our website is this. To become a physician, you need to know the body's machinery down, right down to the smallest cell. <laughs> so here we are, Maya. This is one of the 2,000 medical schools, and this is what we say. I have been pointed out to the deanery that it might be a good idea to change this, but I don't think anybody has time to do it. So they sent me here, but uh, they don't change this. Uh, I will go right into general practice, because it has been a site of uh, discussion this morning, and I will present you to the challenge Helena. She's 54 years old, married for the second time. She has low education. She has a strained economy, but she manages. And she has a list of diagnoses. I will just leave it to you to read them. I think it's quite readable. And she, hmm? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And she uses like seven to nine drugs daily. She has not reached the 18 drugs yet that were uh, in the tabloid press, but she's only 54. She still smokes, however, despite advice. And we do tell our students from the very first day that they should work in a patient-centered biopsychosocial manner. The big question, of course, is what does that mean? And we have not solved that in Trondheim, but I think perhaps we can move forward trying to, to get closer to understanding each other. So I have actually asked if we in Trondheim, our little group, could take on this special interest group uh, but I would certainly hope that Maya and other people here would like to join in and even take over at some time. But we are struggling. Why is personhood relevant in healthcare? And does ma mainstream medicine approach persons? And if things need to be changed, what and how? It's those things we're talking about here. If we go back to Helena with her many diagnoses, this is how mainstream evidence-based medicine tells you to treat her. And it's called silo medicine. It's not a I didn't invent that expression. It comes from YAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. We took just one of her silos, and that is the cardiovascular silo. It could have been diabetes or hypertension. You find expert groups and task forces, patient organizations, sponsors, and guidelines. And I would actually like to add uh, quality indicators, as you say. Each of these silos have their own targets and, and quality indicators. And the problem for the GP is, of course, that there is not only one silo, but all these silos are relevant to a person like Helena. So it's no wonder that the person, as a living human being, is lost in this picture. Um, since around 2012, there has been a lot of focus on the concept of multimorbidity. British Medical Journal and The Lancet here as examples. There has, of course, been a lot of writing about this before, but this is when it really emerges into the mainstream journals and becomes something that everybody talks about, everybody wants to research it, EU applications, and, and still we are not really understanding what it's all about. Here we have done some uh, empirical work that's actually impressed in this fabulous journal that uh, we have been he hearing about this morning. Uh, we have a list of index diseases uh, uh, this way uh, down the... The, um, here, this comes from a big Norwegian population study. It has been said to be the biggest in the world of its kind. I'm not sure, but it sounds good. If we take, for instance, diabetes, the, the disease here, one of the diseases of Helena, and you look along this line here, you can see all patients with self-reported diabetes in this huge population study. I'm sorry. Um, 
The yellow line are people with only diabetes. If you go to the, to the pink line, they have one more disease. If you go to the red line, they have two more diseases. If you go to the dark red, wine, blue line, you have the rest of them, which means that it's far more common to have many diseases than only one disease. And it goes for the whole list of normal, non-communicative uh, health problems that we have been hearing about this morning. Another part of the evidence from this study is that these diseases try tend to cluster in very unscientific ways. They don't behave the way they should because mental and physical problems overlap everywhere. You could take the type of disease that people think it's just bad luck, th thyroid disease, that you have to take th th thyroxine. Well, there is a large po possibility that you also have other problems and you can choose any disease known to man or almost and you will end up with some kind of cluster picture. The best known is this one up here, cardiovascular problems mental health problems and other metabolic diseases. This has been known for such a long time that cardio cardiologists have suggested behavioral cardiology as a special speciality because people are often depressed when they have heart problems and the other way around. So this clustering is telling us that there is something wrong with the way we conceptualize the human body and I think that's fitting well with the idea of a lived body and not a machine. We have also been investigating risk factors and published in the Journal of Evaluation of Clinical Practice. To make a very long story short, uh, you see the age of the participants in the same population, as I mentioned, from 20 to 80. And you can see the number of participants who are at different levels of risk. And you can just qualitatively look at the picture. The green corner is the free zone. Those people have no risk factor for diabetes or cardiovascular disease. That's, those are only those diseases. The rest have some kind of risk, which means, according to guidelines, that they should have medical attention at some level. And uh, you can see at the corner, to the right, those with established disease. They are not the majority. So we think this risk epidemic is or should be thought of as indicative of flawed thinking at several levels. It's the way we conceptualize the body, also how we use, use mathematics, because there are many flaws in the algorithms, possibly. We have published about cholesterol. Andrew Miles knows all about that. We had letters from the editor, and I don't know what, because you're not supposed to argue with people who think that cholesterol is dangerous, no matter what. A third indication that something is wrong in the basic way medicine is thinking is this list of complex disorders. The fact that so many people suffer from so-called functional disorders and it's not meant in the sense that there is something wrong in the body's function because that would actually be a good way of thinking it. It's somehow called mental, you know, people just imagining they are not really sick. Some people talk about conversion disorder, somatization. We have lots of very vague uh, expressions that, that keep us thinking and thinking. And then we can add. Recently, people have spoken much more about medically unexplained symptoms or physical symptoms and various uh, syndromes to explain this. And somehow, medically unexplained is taken as something acceptable instead of saying, how come it does not make sense to medicine? Can there be something wrong with the way medicine is thinking? And you can, of course, add more. And there are hundreds of these acronyms People can have serious problems in so many body parts and these problems tend to overlap and we don't understand the thing because we cannot see anything on, on the tests that we are offering. So I think there is again an indication of flawed understanding that we have to take on from within medicine. We can't ask philosophers to save us from this kind of messy thinking. Somebody a long time ago must have had a feeling that something was going wrong with with science. This is William Blake. Actually, I think he has influenced Gregory Bateson a lot because he, Gregory Bateson grew up with pictures by William Blake. But this is Newton. The way Newton is conceptualizing reality in the light and look at the messy reality behind his bottom. I really love this picture. It's, uh, it's small, it's in the Tate Gallery and you have to look a while to find it. But I, I contemplated that when I saw it. So, a few years ago, <coughs> together with a couple of colleagues in this little uh, GP research group, we wrote this editorial. 
too much doing and too little thinking in medical science. And uh, yeah, well, it survives. We haven't had a lot of quotes, I think, but I think there is something to this argument still. And wh what kind of thinking are we then needing, uh, among other things, to move forward? I'm not saying this is the solution, but it's part of the solution, just like Maya is speaking about phenomenology. Is again going back to this quote and seeing what does it really mean from a biomedical perspective? We are so used to thinking about those two scientific cultures, molecular medicine or biomedicine on the one side, which deals with the so-called body machine, and then meaning and experience, the psychosocial part and the humanistic sciences on the other. And we are telling our students to get this together and help Helena in a person, no, patient-centered matter. And what happens is that Helena falls between these <coughs> chairs. It doesn't really work in practice. What I am Oh yeah, it has jumped a bit. Well, uh, what I am occupied with, uh, I've been collecting evidence for many years now, how a humanistic insight can also be gained by high-tech methods. In a sense, we are investigating ourselves to the kind of knowledge that our grandmothers used to have about life being difficult, is a risk factor, and so on. And just mentioning some of the arenas where this is going on, and, and I cannot go deep into that in this lecture, but, but uh, somehow, high-tech medicine is saving humanistic thinking from the perspective I see from within medicine because once you can prove something by natural science methods it becomes true and doctors are accepting it as a way of so uh, there's a little bit victory here it is a bit backwards having to prove what people have known for centuries but anyway to me it works because at least the students in our university they become fascinated by this there are many more people who have been thinking about this, and one of them who really made a difference to my reading of the literature was Nancy Krieger. She is an epidemiologist at Harvard. She wrote in 2005 a conceptual glossary for epidemiology about embodiment, and she claims, recognizing that we as humans are simultaneously social beings and biological organisms, the notion of embodiments advances three critical claims. One. Bodies tell stories about and cannot be studied divorced from the conditions of our existence. Two, bodies tell stories that often, but not always, match people's stated accounts. And three, bodies tell stories that people cannot or will not tell, either because they are unable, forbidden, or choose not to tell. All this is present in clinical medicine, I assure you. There was an immunologist who pointed this out to me, and I really like it. Carl von Linné, who he was making a taxonomy of living organisms, or living and dead plants and animals, he came to the gene the species Homo sapiens. And it must have been a time when he had to think a lot before he came up with know thyself as the characteristic of human beings. It's the same as in the temple of Delphi, you know, the entrance to the temple of the Apollo temple, <coughs> by the way. And from there, I think we can jump to Eric Cassell's definition of a person, probably the same as uh, the universe as Pellegrino and others. I don't think we should have to choose one person. But he, he underlines that the person is an embodied, purposeful, thinking, feeling, emotional, reflective, relational, human individual, <coughs> always in action, responsive to meaning, and whose life in all spheres point both outward and inward. So here we are back to purpose, the body with a purpose, not only the machine. And then we can go to the storytelling brain. There is not much about this because narrative medicine until now has kept away from biology, I think. Far, far away from biology, it shouldn't. It should come much, much closer because psychoneuroendocrino immunology and all these Biological mechanisms, they, they are so closely connected to human narratives and we have to embrace this and try to be scientific about it. And um, here is one paper I wrote together with two of my colleagues. Uh, it exists also in English if you want some evidence, but you can also have my slides and I have lots of references if you like. Another close collaborator we have is uh, Bruce McEwen. He's a professor of neuroendocrinology. He's not nuts, but he, he's working in the, in the neuroscience. And we have been discussing a lot and, and writing a little bit together. And, and he is a stress physiologist. He's really looking at what happens to the human organism under stress. And 
he has a concept called allostatic load. I will not go deep into that now, but it has to do with how you stay alive through challenges and changes and what happens if you are never allowed to relax, calm down and have support. Here is where phenomenology, in a sense, meets biology. <coughs> you can look at the gains and the drains in human life and you can look at them, in a sense, as opposites. And again, and long story short, on this draining side, the pathogenetic side, people who are threatened, betrayed, betrayed neglected, humiliated or left behind or struggle with guilt and shame, it feeds into their physiology. On the other side, the gaining uh, elements of trust, respect and care is sustaining a physiology that is uh, health promoting. Of course, this has a lot to do with the clinical relationship, but also with the whole person narrative beyond medicine. So what I think we have to do much more of, and I think this adds very good to the WHO perspective, this idea of the courses behind the courses. I have read everything by Michael Marmot, who used to chair WHO's Commission on Social Determinants of Health. We have to think more about the biology of disadvantage. The fact that we have social gradients, and these are increasing in Europe. And I think it's so important, as it was pointed out this morning, that we cannot only do the best for the single person in front of us. We have to think of community as well and be politically alert to what is happening because once people are down on the social ladder, they become sick at a much higher level. Another paper that I would uh, recommend for you, again from this fantastic journal, is written by my colleague Anna Louise Kirkingen and a physiotherapist called Aline Thunquist. They go exactly where Maya is, the lived body as a medical topic, and, and <coughs> adds an argument for an ethically informed epistemology of medicine. My final words now. We are working with something that is called person-centered, and that's a movement. We have been discussing it as a new movement in many respects because it introduces the clinician also as a person, and we can, we can co-create care. But there is something else going on. I think some of you might have noticed it. It's something called personalized medicine. And the bell's ringing, and there, I think, is a, there is this fence between these two. And we have to be alert what is happening with the word person now, because it is happening, it is becoming a sales uh, icon, personalized. The point that personalized in this other session is it's extremely individualistic. It's yourself measuring yourself over a lifetime, your apps and your uh, computer and your smartphone, everything. So we have to take care, because this is another milestone paper, which is not in the person-centered movement. It has been endorsed by the president of the Wonka, the GPs of the world, and it suggests the following. It is going to be predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory, P4. That sounds really quite close to what we're up to, except the idea here is that each patient will be surrounded by a virtual cloud of billions of data points. And we will need information technology to reduce this staggering data dimensionality to simple hypotheses about health and disease for each individual patient. There are 64 system biologists behind this paper. It's highly influential. And this is where the industry is going now. So beware, because we don't know. I left Helena, but I introduced Hans. How is his GP going to be? Is he going to be a bioinformatician? And is Hans becoming a mathematical construct, like a molecular me avatar? That remains to be seen. And I think whilst we are working on this person-centered healthcare, we have to be aware of it. And at least I have written one paper with this uh, neuroendocrinologist from the USA about how to try to keep both these uh, movements together. I don't think we will succeed, but at least this is an attempt. And, uh, I think we have to really struggle against this uh, idea that all your data will become your person. And I think that is my last picture. And I have one minute and seven seconds that I have stolen from the common time. But thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and non-foundationalism and the role they might play in supporting a person-centered medicine. I'd like to motivate this talk with a report that was just published last year by the Institute of Medicine, which is a branch of uh, National Academy of Sciences in the United States, and it's an, 
a quote from it says, studies indicate that cancer care is often not as patient-centered, coordinated, accessible, evidence-based as it could be, having a detrimental impact upon patients. And they propose a conceptual framework which addresses these problems, engage patients, an adequate staff trained and coordinated workforce. This is the patient-centered uh, part uh, uh, framework for addressing the problem of patient-centeredness uh, and coordination, accessible and affordable care for accessibility, and then evidence-based care, healthcare and information technology, which we just got a glimpse with in terms of uh, systems medicine, and then translational medicine, which is another important um, uh, growth in medicine today. They provide a nice diagram, which I think is very interesting. If you see here, patients are in the center, and then they are surrounded ultimately by a base, by the evidence base and the information technology uh, that allows you to translate the uh, basic sciences into clinical care. So we have the patient-centered medicine and evidence-based care. Sounds very good, doesn't it? Right? Rhetorically, it sounds beautiful. But there might be some problems here. And that's what I'd like to take a look at. First, I'd like to take, um, you all know this definition. This is from uh, David Sackett. And here we have uh, the triad, the EBM triad, current base evidence, the best evidence possible, yoking that with individual clinical expertise, and then enfolding the patient's preferences. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Miles said um, earlier today, uh, oftentimes both the clinical expertise uh, and the patient uh, values, um, oftentimes there's lip, lip service or that's, that's uh, just given scant um, uh, attention. There are a number of problems with evidence-based medicine. We've just seen in um, the British Medical Journal, um, just published just recently, that um, there seems to be something amiss uh, with evidence-based medicine. There's been lots of criticism. Um, one is limited patient applicability, uh, especially in terms if you're working out a patient vis-a-vis -a, -vis a bell bell-shaped curve. Where does that patient fit within it? How well does the all of that is, is well known to you. There's also the, uh, as um, uh, Maya had, had, had pointed out, uh, there was a de-emphasization then of clinical expertise in terms of intuition. Um, but probably one of the most damaging criticisms uh, comes from philosophy, and that is the foundationalism of evidence-based medicine is naive when it comes to the evidence. Evidence does not translate into facts does it provide a foundation or a base for then making inferences? This foundationalism, um, I'm not going to go into this slide uh, just to sort of make up some time here, but the foundation, the evidence-based foundation, really is undercut by things like underdetermination thesis uh, or theory uh, ladenness of the data itself. So foundationalism Today, within philosophy, it's, uh, it's given way to coherentism. We'll talk about that uh, later on. But probably one of the most difficult problems that has arisen with evidence-based medicine, and that's been mentioned many times here, is the impersonalism. Uh, and it's been described as the objectivist conception of reality reducing personal being to an epiphenomenal reflection of objective reality and moral concepts to private idiosyncrasies. And as we've seen before, the person becomes a mechanistic machine, person becomes reduced and anatomized, person becomes objectified and abstracted or universalized, and finally, quantified and averaged. So how then do you apply all of the um, evidence that you might have from clinical trials to that patient standing before you. I'm just going to talk about two cases of how this has pervaded um, medicine, both from 
the patient's perspective as well as the clinician's perspective. This is a patient. This is a well-known economist uh, in the United States. You may, may know him. He wrote in praise of personal medicine. I have nothing against my physician. Local magazine praises him. But I would prefer to be diagnosed by a computer. And this is this idea that somehow we are machines and we can be diagnosed by machines. The second comes from a physician himself, Silverman, says, is it bad that you do not have a doctor, but an insurance card that entitles you to a menu of diagnostic procedures, laboratory tests, physical examinations, and specialty referrals at specific locations? And in a blog, in response to his editorial, uh, Dr. Montgomery says, um, yes, it's different, but is it wrong? Not if it is done in a patient-centered way that honors that primary doctor-patient relationship. There's a problem here, isn't there? Can you sense it? How can you have patient-centered medicine in an impersonal world that then respects that dyad, that therapeutic dyad. So there's this confusion that exists within the literature of how to intertwine these two approaches to the practice of medicine, either evidence-based medicine or patient-centered medicine, when you have these epistemological and ontological problems uh, that are surfacing in the practice of medicine. Uh, it's also on bioethics, and I'm not going to go over that slide. We've had mention already of Cassell. If you've not read Cassell's book, it's well worth, worth reading. But let's just take a close look at patient-centered medicine. Is Dr. Montgomery right? Is just throwing patient-centered medicine into the mix, or as the IOM tried to do in terms of its report last year, is that going to help? And there's been a number of talks here this morning which have raised issues. Again, here's another study from the IOM about the quality chasm that existed in American medicine beginning, it's a, over a decade old now, and they define patient-centered medicine as care that is respectful and responsible to the individual patient, preferences, needs, and values, and, ins and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. What happened in practice of this, I think Fred Tauber, who has written quite a bit on this, and he's talked about sick autonomy. Patient-centeredness was based upon, or founded upon, not evidence, but upon respect for the autonomy of the patient. And when that pendulum swung, it swung so far that Tauber says two things happened. One, the patient was abandoned. Now the patient has to make the decisions. You're offered a cafeteria, uh, assortment of possible procedures, you make the choice upon your preferences. And Tauber, in his book called The Confessions of a Medicine gives a really good example of this, of a friend of his who had a bleeding disorder. Tauber knew about what would probably be best, but even Tauber, as a friend, uh, did not weigh in on how to help this patient make the decision. What happened? The patient died made the wrong decision, okay? And so what Tower says, there's a second problem here, and that is not only has the patient been abandoned, but also it's marginalized clinicians in terms of their expertise and being able really help to address the issues uh, the patients need to take into consideration. So uh, you've got patient-centered evidence-based medicine, and so there are problems associated with this. And as we have also heard in other talks, patient or person-centered medicine has now come along to try to address those issues. You've seen this already in Maya's talk. What I would like to just emphasize, person, 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 person. And that of, for, by, and with are relational prepositions. Right? Except for of, that's, gen that's possessive, but that can also be relational in the term. It's not to the patient. 
as it was within the older uh, tradition. So personalism, what is it and can it help us in terms of giving us a, a sort of robust philosophical foundation for patient-centered medicine? This is uh, Patricia Sayer who says personalism in the broad sense is a philosophical stance, perspective that takes the concept of personhood to be indispensable and central to the proper understanding of reality. Well, okay, that's, that's helpful. Um, exactly what does that mean? Um, it has been reduced down to two commitments in terms of the pri uh, primacy of the personal, that is the subject-related categories of value and meaning. And secondly, it has this communitarian or communitive aspect to it that people are in relationship to one another. And so there is a subject-related categories, which he calls subjectival. Well, <laughs> if you look in the OED, there's no word of subjectival. But I think what Hayek is trying to get here, and this comes from the phenomenological literature, that genuine objectivity is not an abstraction or universal, but rather yoked to the lived experience in the sense that one must be an authentic person or authentic subject. That out of that relationship, then one has evidence or information that allows you to make decisions that are for the best of whoever is making that decision in case of medicine it would be the patient. And I think that's what is being driven at, at here. Personalism, as, as well as impersonalism, I didn't get to go over that slide, has um, been appropriated for uh, bioethics by Schatzman. This article was written in 1999. And there's been no other literature that I've been able to come up with on personalism within bioethics. And what he says, the personalistic approach offers a relational foundation for medicine as a healing profession. And I think he's on target there, and I'm going to try to maybe not convince you, but at least open up the possibility. He also says it provides a, um, an ethical framework for taking a look at modern technology that's being um, uh, advanced into the field. And he bases the human person on being uniquely original, that is, in terms of this life project, both for the patient who is coming with this illness story, as well as for the physician and the hospital, the healthcare team. All of these have this life story that somehow must converge in this very unique way. Secondly, it's relational obviously in terms of this being intersubjective, and then it's community solidarious, that is in terms of a responsibility, a fiduciary responsibility of the physician uh, and healthcare team for providing the best possible medical care or, or health care for that patient. So it's just one approach, but it's just been left fallow. There's not been much uh, taken up with this. Now he talks about challenges to personalism in ethics. And I'd like to leave you with three challenges today in terms of appropriating personalism for medicine. And the first is we must have at least a good working definition of what is personhood. We've seen Cassell um, uh, in terms of how Cassell had, had um, defined the person, and that's a very good um, uh, start for working it. There are a number of philosophers who have talked about personhood, but I think we have to take Ruth Macklin's um, advice in this, in that values oftentimes are assumed, and the conclusion follows from those values. So you've got a circularity here in terms of the argument. You always have to keep that in mind. And so pluralism, uh, I think, might be a, a, a good approach to maybe addressing or coming up with a... Um, with a, uh, a possible working condition. Michael Goodman provides some very uh, nice, what he calls sufficient conditions. And it's this last one, I think, that's, that's really important. Medicine is Tauber, Cassell, Pellegrino, 
Kamazma, a number of philosophers of medicine said it is a moral enterprise first. It's a moral relationship between this patient and the healthcare team for the healthcare team to have this fiduciary relationship to provide the best possible care. In other words, to not do harm. And I think phenomenology offers a very nice approach to this, uh, a recent publication on this, this personal, personalistic phenomenological metaphys metaphysics where life is fragmented enough. What makes it difficult for patients, especially within the United States, is then they come to a healthcare system that is what? Even more fragmented. And it causes a lot of, of problems. And so phenomenology, I think, is really a place to begin in terms of coming up with a working definition, this lived experience, so that one provides or at least decreases the amount of fragmentation that goes on in terms of providing health care. Personalism as a philosophical field has been around for thousands of years. It really took off at the end of the 19th, early part of the 20th century uh, in the United States and then fell flat by mid 20th century. Um, there are a number of, as, as uh, Thomas Williams here in his, his article in the Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy says there's just not a single personalism. There are multiple personalisms. They can be divided up. He divides them up in terms of idealist, phenomenological, existential, optimistic. There's also naturalistic. There's also idealistic. <laughs> uh, you name it, there's a personalist philosophy to that. They can also be divided up in terms of nationality and geography, European, American, even American divide up in the Bostonian, Chicago, uh, Eastern. Uh, he provides these characteristics, which are a nice beginning, uh, possibly to coming up with a working definition for personalism. But both that personhood and personalism, there needs to be a lot of work. It's a real challenge if you're going to be able to use personalism as strengthening the foundation for a person-centered medicine. And finally, one of the challenges is since most of the personalism, the philosophical perspective, is at least 50, 60 years old, although there is some current um, uh, Catholic uh, personalist philosophy, but bringing it into the 21st century. Um, and that is basically contemporizing it so that it really speaks uh, to the 21st century uh, situation. That is a major challenge uh, when you read these earlier personalists. Finally, it's my last slide uh, on this non-foundational. It's not anti-foundational, but non-foundational. And as I said, foundationalism as an epistemic philosophical position is, is, does, is, is not in favor today. You have more of a non-foundational uh, epistemology, which is holistic which I've represented here is the uh, circle, and we've heard about holism, the whole person, both the biopsychosocial model and other models that are out here. But epistemologically, it's a coherence where beliefs are not justified by epistemic or, or an empirical base, but by consistency, coherent, uh, cohesiveness, and comprehensiveness. Uh, that, and again, there are problems uh, that are going to surface with this non-foundational uh, approach, but it seems to be uh, the best approach. I'd like to challenge this notion of, of centeredness as a metaphor. And during the panel discussion, if you remember, it was asked, who's in the center? It's like the old um, cliche, you know, who's on first? Right? Who's going to occupy the center? And so this raises an issue with centeredness as a metaphor for being able to develop a person-centered medicine. Is that person the patient? Does it flip-flop? Does it become um, the, the physician? And Professor Ellis, as we were walking over for coffee, said, well, you know, this, this introduces problems, right, in terms of, well, yeah, uh, how, how's the physician going to be you know, person-centered here in this, it, it, it raises some ontological issues 
in trying to define the person, but how do you relate or locate that person within this larger system? And what I would, you know, would another, another metaphor work? These are some of the others you can find within the literature. It could be focused. Um, it could be oriented, all of these. But I would say let's just drop the metaphor. I think there's enough richness within personalism as a philosophical position, if we can work that out in terms of defining what the person is, to be able to just call it personalist or personalistic medicine. So I think those are the real challenges that face using personalism and trying to move from a, a movement that's, that's dependent upon this metaphor of center to maybe think about moving away from that to more of, more of a, a just simpler uh, ontological position of just calling this personalistic medicine. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful to be here. Right, first of all, if you make a note, you can find me at that email address. I have very deliberately prepared the slides so that they are a summary of two papers. So the, if you have a copy of the overheads, there are, I prepared 27. There was absolutely no possibility, and I never intended to, and I'm not going to go through 27 slides in 20 minutes. But what you will find is that those slides bring those two papers together, summarise them, and give you a framework, and so that you can go through 27 slides. They're nearly narrative, but they're bullets and then you'll be able to follow. I only really worry about getting up to maybe about slide 13 today. So we can go fairly, fairly, be fairly relaxed. You've got two sound, strong papers to read, and you've got the slides as a guide, the overhead projection to, as a guide to them. And uh, there is a slide, actually, which tells you why I say medicine is not science, guessing the future and predicting the past. So could we have slide the next slide? Thank you. So two papers, Medicine is Not Science and Medicine is Not Science, Guessing the Future, Predicting the Past. 15,000 words, try and cover those in 20 minutes, not possible. That's why you've got the slides. So don't forget, it's Clifford Miller at cliffordmiller.com. I can email you a set of the slides tonight if you want them. So if you're interested in what I have to say, ask. And if you're not, then you don't have to worry. You can go to sleep now. OK. Uh, Oh, sorry, just go back to slide two. Uh, I'll, I'll call the number and let you know. Okay. Um, what I'm presenting is iconoclastic, but not because it's controversial. These are our, our two papers. My colleague, um, Donald Miller, who's not related to me, he's, he's, he's recently retired. He's emeritus professor of surgery at the University of Washington. We were both quite surprised by what came out of these analyses. Just conventional analyses, but it we hadn't found anyone had done this thinking before. Um, <coughs> the references for the two papers are there, so you can get them off the slides, and they've only just been published. Um, and I'm also grateful to the Society for the invitation to come and present these papers. Um, <coughs> could we just jump to slide 18, please? That's it. Now, I'm jumping to slide 18 in, in the light of presentations by, for example, uh, uh, Professor Maya Goldenberg, um, because there are quite a lot of um, similarities and parallels. Um, and I'm jumping to slide 18 because complexity teaches us that we cannot predict, using science, what the human body is going to do. Uh, and we're only now catching up with what the mathematicians knew over 100 years ago. And there's an excellent book by Henri Poincaré, the French mathematician, uh, Science and Science et Method, in 1908, which is an English translation published in 1914. And it's a narrative. It's not a mathematics book. Anyone can read it. And in that book, um, he explains simple things like why we can't predict the weather. We can't predict the weather for the same reason we can't predict what the human body is going to do by science. Full stop. I'm using mathematics and science to tell you you cannot use science to predict what the human body is going to do. And complexity theory is a big new thing now.
but it goes back over 100 years. And complex systems, human body, companies, economies, countries, non-linear, they behave as non-linear dynamic systems. So you can't develop theories to predict how they're going to behave. And even if you could, the problem which was discovered in the 1960s by Lorentz in trying to predict the weather was that tiny errors in measuring rapidly make any predictions irrelevant that the real system, as it behaves, behaves completely differently to how it predicts. And this is why we can't predict the weather. But Henri Poincaré, in 1908, was telling us why we couldn't. And he did it in plain, simple language. And it's almost a populist book, but extremely... I, I can't believe how well uh, expressed it was. So that's why I want to... Uh, could we go to slide 19, please? Um, consequences. These are going to be conclusions, and you can quite happily disagree with these if you want. But consequences for complexity uh, include that we can only use professional expertise, intuition, and judgment when making decisions in medicine. That's all we've got on top of other, all the other information and knowledge that we have, including scientific. That's the only way we can do it. Um, and there are ways in which we can improve upon that. So I'm, I've jumped to these slides in the light of what people have said before, because I want to establish very clearly and firmly, you are not listening to a lawyer telling you, I'm simply reporting what we already know from over 100 years ago and that people are now beginning to click into and understand. So if we could go back to um, slide three, please. What I'm presenting to you as a concept is knowledge-based medicine. I'd much rather go to somebody who knows than somebody who's looking for the evidence to try and work out what to do. Uh, there is no hierarchy of evidence in evidence, none. And from a legal perspective, from a uh, background in evidence, the whole concept of the hierarchy of evidence is an anathema to how we make decisions using evidence. Uh, there's a reference to the paper, there's another paper with myself and Donald Miller, um, <clears throat> and you can go to that. But I, I think what really is needed is, is a paper that analyses why a hierarchy of evidence is, is not a sensible way of approaching this. Um, the, these two papers were prompted by a request by Professor Andrew Miles to explain scientific, unscientific, and non-scientific knowledge to try and put to bed old conflicts in medicine about knowledge. And what I'm endeavouring to do is to set out a roadmap of knowledge. The bullet points are the topics that I endeavour to address and consider it horizontal, not a hierarchy. Because in evidence, you get together all of the evidence, you look at it, is it reliable, is it relevant, and then you assess it all together. Um, so I'm going to go through each of these areas uh, one by one. So if we could have the next slide, please. This is figure one from Medicine is Not Science. And the point of this, and you can read it in the paper, the point of this is if spaceflight was done by soft science, astronauts would never find their way out of their front doors in the morning, let alone get off the planet. So if, if physical science theories were right 70% of the time, then spaceflight would be impossible. To get a craft off this planet and into space requires very reliable theories that can predict new circumstances to a very high degree of success. And they've all got to work together to get that craft off this planet. Soft sciences don't work like that. You cannot combine theories like that. One theory in psychology, 70% of the participants react in the way you expect and 30% don't. They're heterogeneous. This is just like in, med in medicine, psychology, uh, in the sense they're a heterogeneous group. 
um, <coughs> any theory is going to be falsified by one irregular outcome, and you've got 30% of your heterogeneous group. So you're going to end up with incomplete explanations, but we'll come to that. If we could have the next slide, please. How are we doing for time? Oh, not bad. We don't know what the word science means. In fact, I'm, I've developed an aversion to the word science. If anyone uses the word science and scientific to describe something, I, I now turn off because when you start to think about all the different ways in which we use the word science and scientific, it's contradictory, vague, meaningless, and really misleading. Um, <coughs> Albert Einstein you know, got a lot of things right, but uh, I don't think he got this one right. And I don't think he's, you know, for, for a genius, um, uh, a refinement his, of his everyday thinking is not the same thing as the refinement of the thinking you'll find in a soap opera. Uh, and if science includes marketing, well, to launch a spacecraft requires a certainly uh, a higher degree of reliability of theory than to launch a product on the market. So if we go to the next slide, please. Here are some basic propositions. Science does not mean reliable knowledge. And you're going to see that from what well, more there's more to come. There's a lot of unreliable knowledge in science. <coughs> and it's a myth that science is reliable, which is a harmful myth. Because people will uh, cast aside valid concerns, and they can be routinely dismissed, when science is brought into play as if it were reliable knowledge. And the scientists say this. Well, it may not be. And other knowledge can be very reliable, and we'll see that also. The majority of our knowledge simply isn't science. And it's also wrong to think that unscientific and non-scientific knowledge is not reliable. And we'll see that, we'll see why. Can we have the next slide, please? So if we don't know what we mean by the word science, and if you think about all the different ways we, we use that word, you will start to realise that two people can have a conversation using the word science, they both go away thinking they've had a valu valuable exchange and they both use th that word in conflicting ways in that conversation. And they may even themselves use that word to mean totally different things in the same sentence. So the conventional conception is what school children and undergraduates are taught about science. Um, to illustrate, because I need a benchmark. If I can't define science, I've got to have some kind of benchmark. So let's use the physical sciences, because they have presented us with well-validated theories which have proved so reliable that we can send spacecraft into space. And in fact, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are about 4 billion miles away at the moment. And I think some of the, the one or other or both of them are still transmitting. And very, very clever to get them there. Um, <coughs> The scientific method is an idealised representation, um, and it's not the only way that we do, quote, science. Uh, experimental verification is fundamental to science, and it's consistent with Thomas Kuhn's description of normal science in his uh, structure of scientific revolutions. Um, <coughs> it's how science is conducted on a day-to-day -day basis carrying out experiments, repeating them, reproducing them, and validating theories to a high degree. Subject, of course, to uh, a theory being invalidated, uh, falsified by you know, one erroneous result. So for the next slide, please. <coughs> so looking at the physical sciences, the characteristics of the physical sciences drop away for the other areas of knowledge that we'll be looking at. So I just checked my time here. We have a high standard of proof. Verification of theories by achieving strict regularity of outcomes in, in experiments. Every time we repeat an experiment, we reproduce it, we look for the same results. And if we get one irregular outcome, our theory is falsified. 
but successful validation leads to an inference that theories are of universal general applicability. Anywhere in time and space you can use that physics or map chemistry theory. We, we believe, we infer. We don't need that for all other knowledge. But what we end up with is high predictive success in brand new situations. But we don't need necessarily that kind of predictive success in other areas. And physical sciences and chemistry are not perfect. There are anom anomalies which are ignored by scientists. They know they exist and they will produce incorrect results, but they still use the theories because they work. Um, and some are still searching for a theory of everything. Uh, and that, um, in fact, some have given up. And they've realized it's impossible to uh, achieve a theory of everything. So can we next? Experimental intervention and a strict re regularity of outcome. And this is a second slide on my first heading of knowledge as physical sciences as a benchmark. An intervention means you drive the direction of causation. And in medicine, you want to know, does factor X cause disease Y? An experiment demonstrates a causal association, whereas purely observational studies cannot tell you whether one factor is caused by the other or whether they just happen to be there at the same time. And slide 24, which we won't be dealing with, but which you can have, addresses that aspect, um, the Bradford Hill criteria, the US Surgeon General's criteria, those sorts of things. It's judgmental. The point is, it's judgment. You have to exercise judgment. It's not science. Um, <clears throat> the point, I think, to take away on this slide is that experiment is an excellent way of resolving dispute. You use a very narrow evidence base, but you get a very wide eventual consensus. It acts as an independent arbiter, <coughs> eliminating bias and personal judgment, those sorts of things. Do we have the next slide, please? Our most reliable form of knowledge, now I'm misleading you with this slide in a sense, because Michael Laughlin and um, Maya Goldenberg can tell you in terms of philosophy, what I'm, what I'm explaining here is highly simplified and in many ways wrong, but in terms of explaining the point, it's, it's right to do it this way. We learn by experience, reliable empirical knowledge of physical world, always obtained by observation of regularities. We don't need science or theory. We, in fact, do invent theories um, in our minds automatically. We're not, I'm not talking about written down theories. And we do have automatic explanations. But I'm talking about routine stuff, like seeing the sunrise, seeing the sunset, the grass grows, water runs downhill. You can't predict something new from that. You don't need science or theories, but you will know that it's always going to happen like that because it always has. You make an inference, okay, the sun could blow up tomorrow and there's no sunrise. But it hasn't happened in several billion years, several million years. So we're on reasonably safe ground to say it's not going to happen tomorrow and we can predict on that basis. It's how infants learn. It's reliable prediction of what is already observed and known to happen. So in medicine, when you see a lot of patients over 20 or 30 years, and you've seen thousands of them, are you predicting from what you've learned in science, or what's called medical science and medical theory, or are you predicting on the basis of what you've learned over 20 or 30 years? Or is it some combination of that? So you can't, from this kind of knowledge, you can't predict new outcomes, unlike the physical sciences, but it's highly reliable knowledge. Next slide, please. I said it a minute fast. Observational knowledge in medicine, I only want to point out the um, sources of these papers. You can read this yourself, and you can read the papers yourself. The first, Natural Product Reports, is from the Royal Society of Medicine. The next is a reference guide for physicians and pharmacists, which is in its fifth edition. The next, 
Okay, nearly out of time. The next, British Medical Journal, and the last is from Science. So this is observational knowledge in medicine. Have the next slide, please. Will you allow me two minutes? Right. Observational science, experiments are impossible. Scales of time and space, for example, space physics is an observational science. Theories are conjectural. You have to, in order to validate a theory, you have to use judgment. You don't have a scientific experiment with an outcome that's proven the result. So you end up with educated guessing. Um, Wegener's continental drift theories were dismissed in 1929 by the experts. It took another 30 years before seismological data from, uh, in, uh, from American uh, seismometry, which brought in to monitor Russian nuclear experiments, that enabled scientists to actually plot out the tectonic plates and establish tectonic plate theory. But that was an incidental experiment. But it demonstrates, with observational sciences, or what was called descriptive science, how experiment can resolve dispute rapidly. And this is only 19, the 1960s, 1970s. But if you look at the advances in science, we're looking, we were looking at electricity 400 years before that. So experiment provides us with a, a, a much better way, a much more rapid way of, of, of getting um, answers to disputes. Can we have the next one? Now, soft science research is not scientific for these reasons. You cannot carry out scientific experiments like the physical sciences. You end up with conjectural theories. So, if we go to the next slide. So, this is where we end up. Soft and hard science, part company. Experimental validation of soft, uh, soft and purely observational science theories is impossible, absolutely impossible. So, we have to have a conceptually completely different means of deciding whether we're going to accept a theory. And you've got to use expert judgment. Do we accept this psychology theory or this theory in medicine using this heterogeneous population? But the application of judgment is an anathema to science. So, but you have no choice in medicine. I'd like to finish there. And um, oh, uh, you can read about, um, just quickly, can I? Unreliable science, what do we end up with with conjectural theories in, in, in medicine and soft science? We end up with incomplete theories, which they're unreliable. We have incomplete explanations, which don't really explain. And I do recommend the paper by Julian Rice, because that has a lovely way of... You, you, you read his paper and you think, ah, yes, that economics theory, ah, yeah, I understand what's going on here. And then you realise you don't. You have a very partial explanation, and you can't predict anything at all. You have no ability to predict reliably, and you end up with a misguided belief that you understand when you don't. Okay. okay. Thanks for that, Peter. You're welcome. Uh,